a new blog called Learn How to Teach with Fortnite Creative in Your Classroom has recently been released on UnrealEngine.com by secondary educator Steve Isaacs. This is a great blog and I strongly encourage you to check it out if you're interested in working with Fortnite Creative in your classroom. The actual course takes you through a series of lessons including understanding the value of game-based learning in a sandbox environment. It'll work through downloading and installing and launching Fortnite Creative, understanding how to use Fortnite in the classroom, create your own island in Fortnite, using the keyboard and mouse to navigate the Fortnite environment, learn how to use the build tools and pre-built assets included in Fortnite Creative, and build lesson plans using Fortnite Creative to teach context-specific learning outcomes. It's roughly two and a half hours long. This and many other secondary education lesson plans are available to help empower your students to become creators. Here you will find lesson plans for Twin Motion, Unreal Engine, and more for Fortnite Creative. Hello everyone and welcome to Friday's Educator Stream. Today we're welcoming Professor Mark Alano, uh, who's here to talk about uh, his recent uh, instructor guide called, uh, gosh, what is it called? Ah, yes, Navigating, Navigating. Large Code Bases. Yeah. <laughs> and as usual, we have today Tom Shannon, who's joining the stream, as well as Mark Flanagan, who's joining us from London. Welcome. Hope it's cooler than it is here. Yeah, it's pleasant today. Oh, that's Our very heat wave nice. Has ended. And Mark is joining We've us. We've taken it for you. Yes, we have. And Mark's <laughs> joining us from uh, um, Maryland, right? Or where do you actually live? Do you live in the D.C. area? I, I live. I live in Washington D.C. Uh, I, I teach at UMBC, which is in Maryland, up near Baltimore. But I actually live in D.C. Excellent. Well, Mark is a Ph.D. and also um, you are a professor of computer science and electronic engineering at UMBC. And uh, we've got plenty to share with you because we've been working with Mark. Uh, well, I've known Mark now for a couple of years. Uh, and I think I met you for the very first time in person <laughs> uh, when you came to Epic because, yeah, maybe like five years. Um, and you actually spent a year at Epic during your sabbatical uh, when you came and worked with our engineering team. Uh, Mark is a, a kind of a very well-known uh, graphics programmer on top of the fact of being a professor and a PhD. And, um, you know, kind of a fun story is that uh, I think you showed up, I don't remember if it was when you first came to actually start uh, working with us or whether you were there visiting ahead of time. But there I am standing with, you know, Brian Karras and a bunch of, you know, kind of the the top senior uh, graphics programmers at Epic. And, you know, and these guys just revered you in many ways. They were like, oh, you know, Mark Alon is here. You know, and it was really awesome uh, because your reputation precedes you in many ways, which was uh, really impressive because, you know, these guys uh, are the guys that, you know, wrote a lot of the, the core graphics code in Unreal Engine. So well, it was it was fun to be able to spend a year working with the rendering team there, too. Um, they were, you know, they are a lot of a lot of really great and smart people. So, yeah, absolutely. I definitely enjoyed that. Absolutely. And and then you got to write a lot of really uh, important code. So, you know, before we get into all that stuff, you know, tell us a little bit more about yourself uh, and your background, because you've written books, you've published, you know, I think hundreds of papers. Uh, you've recently been the chair of uh, Real Time Live for SIGGRAPH, which just happened this last Tuesday. You know, tell us a little bit more about yourself before we get into all the good stuff. Uh, sure. Uh, so I, um, I got my PhD uh, at uh, University of North Carolina, just down the road from, right. from Epic, um, back in the 90s. Uh, and at the time, uh, there was a big project there to build a new or about the design of new graphics hardware systems. And so my dissertation was actually about how to make graphics hardware programmable. Uh, there were, you know, people had shaders for um, in things like RenderMan for offline and production rendering, but nobody was doing it in hardware because it didn't seem possible. So, so basically, my dissertation was was um, 
yeah, we can actually do this. Um, <laughs> uh, from there, I went to work at um, SGI for a while, if anybody mm -hmm. remembers that. That was, oh, you know, yeah. back when they, that was a company and a company building graphics hardware, both of which are not really true anymore. Um, <laughs> uh, actually, there may be a company with that name, but I don't think it, it's really <laughs> that connected to the SGI from when I was there. Um, uh, so I was, uh, I was there for like four years and, uh, decided that I wanted to you know, get into academia. So I, I started looking around, ended up at, um, UMBC, uh, up near Baltimore, uh, realized that I had spent, um, probably about, you know, 12 ish years in, in different places where I could basically was standing next to the hardware designer and could say, you know, what's the new feature or, hey, how, why don't you add this new feature for me to this new piece of hardware that you're working on? And that wasn't going to work anymore. <laughs> and so given that I, I kind of love real-time graphics, I, I basically started looking around. It's like, who actually uses real-time graphics? Uh, and obviously games. Games are right. a huge, 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 huge user of real-time graphics. So <laughs> I came into game development from graphics. Um, uh, so, uh, I did, uh, started a game development track at, at UMBC. Uh, we actually have two programs, one focused on programmers and one on artists. Um, those being kind of the biggest groups of people in most game development teams. Um, we actually, we don't have a program focused on design, uh, somewhat intentionally because there's usually, I mean, design's the fun stuff, but there's right. usually not as many designers out there and certainly not the entry level positions for them. So we kind of focus on the programming and the art. Um, I did a year sabbatical at Firaxis working on the Civilization V, uh, um, a so second year long sabbatical seven years after that at Epic working on the uh, Unreal Engine rendering team. And I've, I've done some other contract work for a handful of other game companies along the way. Um, right, Activision, uh, Big Huge Games, a couple of the other ones. Yes, yeah, Activision, Big Huge, Oxides, um, uh, and uh, uh, outside of the kind of that stream of things, uh, I've been editor in chief for the Journal of Computer Graphics Techniques for a while now. Um, anyone who's interested in uh, graphics techniques, either either game or production rendering, should check that out. It's it's completely free online journal. Um, and uh, yeah, this year I was running the real time live show at SIGGRAPH, uh, which. Uh, for now, you can watch on demand if you're registered uh, for SIGGRAPH at the sort of ultimate registration level. But uh, as soon as SIGGRAPH is over, so starting you know, about next week or so, it should drop on YouTube um, for anybody to be able to watch. So you be able to check that out. So, I mean, to be doing real-time graphic stuff in the 90s uh, was kind of uh, you know, revolutionary because... There weren't it really was, a lot of people. It was pretty right? cool to be to be working on on especially on like shading stuff back then because um, I was able to do a lot of stuff just because you know we had hardware that nobody else had. Um, right, so, because so, of the SGI computers, I presume, in part, right? Uh, yeah, and and the and the stuff at uh, at UNC, um, which was sort of the first kind of shader programmable hardware. Mm. Uh, so like, uh, um, I don't know if I was necessarily the first person doing normal maps, but I know I came up with the name for that in a paper that I wrote with, uh, um, uh, right? Jonathan Cohen, a, a co-author of mine, um, which is mostly because, uh, everybody else had hardware that couldn't do it. Huh. And, <laughs> and we had <laughs> hardware that could, <laughs> So it's like it's it's hard for people to think. I mean, it's super obvious now. Everybody does stuff like that. But you know, at the time, it was it was just lots of sort of that <laughs> low hanging fruit of of hey, you, we can program this hardware now. What can we do with it? Um, what kind of maps are those? Well, they like normal to me. So that's how, is that how that works? 
Uh, I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> the academic it's process. Strange. Just look in maps in the stack. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's it's graphics. If you don't know what to call something, just slap the name normal on it. Um, <laughs> I normalize you, you know everything or, in my shit. rendering, right? I mean... <laughs> So, I mean, it must be a, a somewhat gratifying now because real time is like such a, everything it has to be real time now. So, I mean, to have been, been doing it for 20 years to be working in real time uh, must be really exciting. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I think I'm probably a little closer to 30 years at it, but, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's both cool to see how it's changed in that time and, and how much it's, it's kind of the same. I mean, you know, a lot of the stuff that I was doing back then on one of a kind hardware that took up, you know, multiple racks in a mm. room in this one building in the computer science department it's here now you know <laughs> this thing <laughs> can do all of that mm -hmm. um and and so it's it's really sort of a a change in in how accessible it is and how how widely used it is which is is yeah super cool so you've been uh, working with your students there at UMBC, uh, you know, helping them to, you know, sort of become the next generation of real-time programmers in, in graphic space. And, uh, and so one of the things that we started talking about uh, four or five years ago, whenever that was that, that we were talking about, um, I think I, it must have been closer towards the end of your year, I think, uh, at, uh, at Epic is... Um, how hard it is and you know just to give some context to the stream today uh, how hard it is for people to step into something like unreal engine right you know uh, and as the 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 loop banner the the slide that opens today's presentation today's stream you know unreal engine by now is you know eight million lines of code um and you know you introduce it to your students and you've been introducing it to your students but even more than that, we started talking about how new programmers coming into Epic, and this is a challenge for not only people coming into uh, Epic and Unreal Engine, but if you're a programmer going to Microsoft and you have to all of a sudden start programming on Microsoft Office or Microsoft Word or Windows or any massive code base, uh, how do you <laughs> check out the code, write your part of it, and then check it in and say, I, you know, I hope this works and it doesn't break everything, right? <laughs> Because, uh, you know, where do you learn? I, you know, is that a Yeah, it's, it's a hard skill to develop because, you know, so much of what you learn in, in like a computer science program, I mean, yes, you're learning to program, you're learning how to design and develop, you know, algorithms, or, or if you're focusing on graphics, you're learning about specific graphics algorithms. But, you know, most of your projects are basically something that you write yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, you think it's big if it's if it's a few, you know, hundred or or even a couple thousand lines of code, and that's just not big. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I I I even run into this when I mean, so you know, if you're using the Unreal Engine source code, you're getting it through GitHub, and and there's certain Git operations that are kind of slow on a, a code base the size of of Unreal, and and I we have some tips in the in the slides on that, but it's uh, um. Uh, you know, if you go looking for how to deal with a large code base in, in Git online, you find all of these hits where it's like, well, I was working with a really large project with thousands of files and, you know, I had no problems. It's like thousands. You think that's big? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, but <laughs> uh, not. <laughs> well, and this is this is kind of this is unusual, too, because I think. And Rails, you know, probably one of the bigger projects up there, say for, you know, some OSs, et cetera. Um, there's just, you know, you don't get code access to things like Max or Maya or Photoshop. Um, or yeah. even, you know, typically you don't get access to other game engines like Frostbite or uh, you know, anything like that. Those, well, those and, code and bases are hard working, to ever see. 
if you're working, whether you're whether you're you know working with the Unreal Engine or anything, I mean, just knowing how to deal with large code bases is something you got to figure out at some point. And you, often people end up having to do it on the job. I know, you know, mm-hmm. one of the one of the things I remember having to do when I was at at SGI was basically you know getting dropped into some code, and, and it's like uh, you know we need to make some changes here. Um, this completely undocumented uh, you know large pile of code, and by the way. You know, the guy who originally wrote it is is not only not at the company anymore, but he's like working for a competitor. So we can't ask him. Right. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, so so you've got to figure have it out the tools to be able to figure out how to get around something like that and, and you know, know what to do and, and how to, you know, how to figure out what it's doing. Maybe without having to understand the whole thing, but just at least get a little bit of understanding around the parts where you're going to be working. Right. So what we did is we said, you know, hey, how about uh, you write, you know, you just spent a year here. I mean, you've uh, had to jump into Unreal Engine at a super deep level because you you wrote some amazing code while in your year there. You basically uh, wrote a lot of the noise uh, algorithms that are being used inside of the engine, probably a lot of stuff that I don't even, you know, have full awareness of the other stuff that you wrote. Yeah, so, so there was already a noise material. So in the material system, there was already a noise material node, but I completely rewrote the code that was that was there and uh, and added the Voronoi noise and the color vector noise and the curl noise, all of those um, to the material system. So yeah, I did those. Um, I did some uh, um, global sampling styles that does like random distributions of points. We were doing that for a uh, positioning lights for uh, for one of the um, uh, Fortnite trailers, I think, mm-hmm. um, to, to make an area light out of a bunch of little point lights. Um, but that that's got into the engine as well. Every yeah. time I I think that. Uh... There, you've you've added some stuff to Unreal that's kind of spoiled me, and every time I think, it's just <laughs> like, like, and it happens actually in like Niagara, where I'm like, oh, I'll just grab a random value, and I'm like, wait, oh, that's only in the material editor because someone wrote a you know pseudo random and a noise thing, and you don't have that in strict HLSO. Oh, <laughs> so thank you for doing that, and also, dang it. <laughs> can we just get those in every aspect now they're, they're really good the noise the noise node is something that as like an fx guy i use all the time and i don't like jumping out to uh other applications um to do stuff often so i love having access to that really high resolution non-performance well, well, putting, sort of noise some... where i can bake it out to or with virtual yeah, textures so now, putting it's... some effort into into those was was actually the, something that came out of uh, talking with uh, Ryan Brooks, one of the uh, tech artists at at, at Principal because, tech artist, yeah, um, because it was uh, you know it's like this is going to be too slow to use um, runtime in a game. So you know it was sort of like so you know no one had really been thinking about putting putting effort into material nodes that weren't going to be usable runtime. And, and as I was, you know, talking to Ryan, I don't know, over lunch or something someday, it was like, yeah, but um, I'm like popping into Photoshop, what he was saying, you know, doing some stuff, importing it back into the engine, seeing what it looks like on a character, popping back over into Photoshop and like that, that, you know, workflow is just bad. And so mm-hmm. having, you know, having better tools in engine mm. that so you could actually develop a look on the assets and then bake them into uh, into a texture to to use at runtime was um, was you know sort of the reason for for spending some effort to make those tools better. Right, right. So you know, so the you are doing all this stuff, and then we have conversation, you know, specifically about. Uh, the challenges of integrating into code bases. And, and when you were preparing to go back, uh, we started talking about, you know, bringing more of the Unreal um, programming discipline to UMBC. And you'd, I think you'd introduced it to some of your higher level PhD students and master's students. But we started talking about, you know, maybe doing some more uh, integration into some of the undergraduate students. And, and you were like, well, 
you know, I'm going to pre prepare more of my students with Unreal, you know, I could, and we've been doing some of these guides already, and uh, and we started discussing the idea of teaching large code large code bases to students, and and we started discussing the the uh, opportunity to develop a guide, you know, about how to teach students how to integrate themselves into large code bases, which is kind of the genesis of this idea that is now this guide that uh, you've completed. Uh, but you didn't just go off and write a guide. You're like, I'm going to teach this stuff. I'm going to make sure that it actually works. And then through the process of teaching it, I'm going to assemble a guide that I'm going to then hand over to you guys. And we're going to make it this really cool epic thing that we can release together. And so kind of that's the nature of today's stream is that you've now completed this guide and it's, you know, something that we're going to turn over to the learning community and that everyone can benefit from. And, you know, you're a, an experienced professor that's actually taught this material in a classroom. Uh, people have gone through all this material. It's been used. And so it's really exciting because it's not like you're like, well, I hope it works. And, you know, and people yeah, so I, I taught a class. Um, as soon as I got back, uh, trying to, to teach um, students how to do like mostly engine development. Um, and yeah, the first time through, I didn't have slides uh, for any of it. I was doing a lot of sort of live demos and I had, you know, like, some notes that I was basically lecturing to, um, but I didn't have slides for it. Uh, you know, next time around, I started to, to kind of build out the slides on it and sort of the third time around is the version that ended up um, being the the actual uh, guide because it just it takes a while to to figure out how to teach some of this stuff mm -hmm. and, and <laughs> kind of what level to teach it at uh, you know to uh, what you know what to, to leave in and what to leave out and you know, how much hand holding they might need at, at what point in the semester. Right. At Epic, we call it dog fooding, right? We, we don't just figure out what to do. We actually figure out what to do. We actually do it internally, and then we release it to the public. And so you dog fooded this process of teaching this content, uh, which is really exciting. Um, so I think it's really uh, pretty awesome. Tom has been working very uh, intimately with this content, and he's gone through it. And, you know, before we actually release this to the public, we, you know, take it through a process uh, Tom's been working with some of the developers. They've gone through the material internally at Epic to try it out and see, you know, how the learning process is it maybe for not one of your direct students because, uh, you know, it's one thing to sit in your classroom and learn this stuff. It's another to go and read through the material and go, you know, let me try it without, you know, Professor Alano there. Yeah, yeah. Catch, catch yeah. those things that are in my head but didn't actually make it out <laughs> onto the into the guide. Um, yeah, right. you need somebody other than me to teach it to, to find those things. Right. Yeah, and and we do that with our guides. Uh, we spend quite a lot of time and, and effort trying to make sure that they are as good as they can be, and that they they do actually can actually follow them through. And and they're not really intended specifically for students. They're really the intention is for educators to use them to teach students. Uh, but we found that you know it's about at fifty fifty. Uh, the folks that download those guides are about. 50% students or self-learners and 50% educators who are also self-learners too. So, you know, a lot of them are going to be teaching themselves this sort of content along with you. And one of the things that's really amazing about this guide, I think that it, that it is really well dog fooded and um, you can just kind of pick it up and read it and go through. And if you're a very motivated self-learner, um, it, you can use it to to get yourself from A to B um, pretty well, and um, you know I've learned quite a lot about Unreal uh, just you know being a, a technical editor and going through it, and uh, my understanding of how Unreal works is much much better now, and I feel I could tackle yeah, and I, much I really, more complex problems. Um, like like I do when I'm teaching it to to my students, I really try to to you know, start with with a lot of hand holding on the, especially like on the, the assignments that are that are listed there, um, where you know you really kind of point them to do this, 
Um, uh, but then as, as you go along, you kind of take the hands off, <laughs> you know, the, of the bicycle or whatever. It's like, you know, it's <laughs> by the end, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a little bit more, you know, just give them the push and, and, uh, <laughs> um, uh, see where it goes. I, I, I mean, if you had to type out everything that you had to do to accomplish some of these things, we would be looking at a book. Like <laughs> kind of that thick because a lot of you know it's like you said in in some of the parts of it, it it's you are very much asking them to go out on their own and and find their way and and spend that time and I don't think one anyone would want to read the step by step of that process and two you wouldn't learn the process so it's it's really it's really well well guided and and even if you don't it all the way um, because of the way it's structured. It's a really great introduction to anyone that's really looking to approach Unreal from kind of not the typical, like you said, game designer, game art sort of bent, but more the the engine programmer. And there there's so many jobs out there. Well, and, and not just engine programmer, because because I mean, one of the things as I was looking around it, so what you know, what material is available? There's lots. There's lots for blueprint. There's lots for materials. There, but there's not really even even kind of the C plus plus level, uh, um, you know, programming at the um, at the project level, not sort of in the engine itself. There's not as much uh, mm -hmm. for that. Right. And and so mm -hmm. you know, so I tried to do it's like. Uh, shader code and then like actor code, uh, which you can totally do, you know, both of those with a, uh, you know, this just a downloaded copy of the engine. You don't actually have to build it from source for that. And then plugins, uh, which you can still do with without having to build the whole thing from source. But then ultimately you get into the, I'm going to actually change the guts of the engine to do something different. Right. Um, well, let's give the viewers. Uh, some some context, some additional context, because um, you know, it's called uh, uh, navigating huge or large code bases. But you get into a lot of stuff here. You get into writing shader code. You get into you know really understanding how to program on the engine side more than gameplay programming. And so, like you just said, um, we've taught we've had a stream recently talking to some of the epic programmers about you know the difference between gameplay programming and engine programming you know and we've had streams about blueprint programming and we have lots of people that ask us you know how where do i learn to program in c++ you know and and you teach a, a huge range of stuff you work with undergraduates you work with masters students you work with phd students and from what I understand, you've had a variety of students sort of working through this content and material. Of course, you have TAs that, that help you as well. Uh, but in this uh, guide specifically, you you've really go through a huge amount of material. You're writing, once again, you know, shader code inside of Unreal Engine. You know, you're, you're breaking apart a, a large part of the engine in the engine part of uh, engine code as opposed to, say, the gameplay side. What other sorts of things, you know, from, I think, how many lectures are in there uh, in the first place? Uh, there's, what, 12 lectures, 13 lectures? How many are there? Uh, that is a good question. I've um, got it over here, too. Let me see. Uh, 11? 11 lectures. So there's 11 lectures, and you've got a lecture. 10 lectures. Shader code. You've got basic actor coding, plug-in. Uh, 11. It should be 11, yeah. I think. Building expertise. Um, so there's a really a large amount of information that you're sharing just about getting into the guts of the engine, which I think a lot of people are really going to appreciate, you know, especially... You know, if you are teaching programming and you want to get into teaching Unreal Engine as a programmer, uh, and in a minute, we're, you know, we're going to hand the reins over to you and you're going to really share some of this material w with our uh, viewer. Tom, is there anything you kind of want to add or jump in there and, and you know, having uh, intimate knowledge of this material? No, I think, uh, you know, I, I do, of course, but I think, uh, I think I'll add to it once we, we dig in because really I think 
getting getting eyes on with it and seeing Let's exactly do that, Joe. what we're talking about here is key because this is kind of an unusual offering what we're offering here as an instructor's guide it it is kind of a curriculum almost mm -hmm. um but we offer our instructor's guides um they they can be used as a straight up curriculum but we offer them as an mit open source uh, i think attribution non-commercial um, so we encourage you to take what's in here and take what you need and take it apart and integrate it into your own curriculum, build a new curriculum from it. So uh, rather than calling it, you know, a curriculum and, and making it feel like it needs to be taught in this specific way, we really present them as just resources for educators to use. Um, yeah, I, I use it in a class that's actually like half this stuff and half uh, real-time graphics algorithms. Um, but you could, you know, you could do just this, you could couple it with something else, um, you know, AI behavior or whatever. Um, you could do part of this, whatever, you know. Great. Well, would you like to share? Mark, are you ready? Sure. Cool. Well, feel free to uh, share your screen and we'll, we will sit back and, and enjoy. Um, am I sharing my screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, let me uh, let me open it up then. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. So let's start with the uh, Ada Code one. Let's go ahead and share that. Um, uh, the whole desktop. Um, yeah, so this is uh, this is like the third lecture or something in there, um, and uh, uh, so like the first lecture is is just how to get yourself set up um, with with Unreal and what the tools are. Uh, I find that even students who are like juniors and seniors, a lot of them aren't necessarily familiar with things like Git, and uh, and so there's a, there's a bit about you know what is on, on that one about what is Git, why would you use it, um, or why would you use any version control? I mean, it's super super important if you're doing you know if you've been in the games industry at all, you or you know software industry, you would would have used something like that, but you wouldn't uh, uh, wouldn't necessarily um, have uh, have used it for that purpose as a student. So I, I have a little bit of that in the first one. Um, but then sort of the first thing I kind of bring them into is uh, is how to write shaders or how to build shaders. And so, and shader code specifically. Uh, so this, this lecture is just kind of walking through uh, how to, um, build yourself a, let me kind of jump towards the end so we can get kind of what the, the thing starts to look like, a cloud uh, shader. Um, and in this example, I went purple. And you, you kind of add, add bits and bits to it. And it does it step by step. This, this, is a, a, um, this is actually a version of a thing that I would normally do just live coding. Um, but kind of, um, I figure... Uh, most people opening up this instructor's guide who haven't spent a year at Epic or haven't been writing shaders for too many years, um, you know, that might be a little daunting. And so going kind of step by step, um, you know, let's add this and see what it does. Let's add this and see what it does. And, and doing that, you know, sort of shader coding instead of materials um, uh, gets you um, to something and and the example i chose was a cloud you could could do anything um you know the, the idea was just to have something that's a practical example to show off um it's pretty funny or not, i don't know funny but it's i i was following this and i was just blown away how simple it was to create a volumetric thing <laughs> when i was like that's it Oh, I should have been using volumetric stuff for ages, but then you get into lighting it, and, <laughs> and then it starts oh. to get real deep real quick. But yeah, it was like super rewarding. Like, oh, I just made a volumetric blobby thing in like a few of code. 
Yeah, and and so um, like the first, so then I have a few extensions uh, like baking or you know making it so you can embed it in, in objects um, uh, and you know adding shadowing and stuff. And and so the the first of the uh, um, the first of the kind of assignments uh, in there uh, is. Um, Taking a second to open um, uh, is basically adding a texture advection so that your uh, so that your cloud will will flow and swirl. So it's basically um, okay. So we did this walkthrough of a shader thing. Let's you know now you know how to do that. Let's add something to it. Um, let's let's build on that a little bit. And so that's that's kind of your. Uh, the first sort of homeworky or assignment thing that we have them do, um, uh, and then there's some lectures on doing uh, um, uh, um, well, there's electron just how do we get around a big code base, but then there's some some actor coding uh, lectures and a and then an actor coding walkthrough. So doing C plus plus code for actors uh, and and kind of comparing. The blueprint versus C plus uh, plus differences, and just sort of walking through, uh, you know, how to do um, uh, baking a texture uh, into or baking something into a texture in a blueprint actor. Um, yes, I know you can just right click and say bake into a texture, but you know, let's see what you let's see how now. you would do this in, the, in in a blueprint actor, um, and then let's do the same thing in C plus plus. Um, and kind of walk through how do you do sort of the same functionality uh, in in C++ um, with some ideas for extensions uh, as well. Um, and, uh, and then, uh, so we have um, uh, in sort of the actor coding assignments, um, uh, I had one that's, um, that's geometry, so basically, uh, oh. When you run it, it builds it builds a big random maze. So it generates um, generates uh, you know, C plus plus code to create to create this sort of random maze uh, environment. Um, and then a second uh, actor coding assignment that's doing uh, behavior where it's a little flocking uh, um, uh, sort of sort of the. Uh, addition to the one of the standard uh, rolling ball examples, uh, but where you have a bunch of balls and they kind of follow around the one that you're driving, uh, like chasing after it. Uh, so it's a classic kind of void behavior, but you're doing it in C++ code in, uh, in actor code. So you're sort of um, building, uh, um, building on that bit that you've, that you covered or learned in the, in those lectures. Um, and then uh, back over here, uh, and then we get into um, plugins um, and uh, uh, and how to do um, uh, uh, so how to add new blueprint functions. So so basically, um, if if I've got something that I want to write in C plus plus code, but I want to be able to add, I want to basically make a new blueprint node that somebody uh, somebody else on the team who's more comfortable with blueprint can use and that this new blueprint node should do something useful and that's maybe a little difficult to, to do in pure blueprint um, uh, so um, so how do you do that what's you know what how do you build a plugin like that and uh, and then the, the sort of corresponding uh, assignments uh, for that um, is uh, is one uh, that um, that places uh, uh, produces random numbers to place things sort of evenly instead of clumpy, which is what you'll get if you use the random node. So basically, you're making yourself a new blueprint node. I don't think I actually have a picture of the node graph in there, but you're making yourself a new blueprint node that somebody who's comfortable with blueprint can use, and it will add this new functionality. So, so the, awesome. the blueprint lectures or the plugin lectures are about how do I build a plugin that adds this new blueprint 
print functionality, and then the, the assignment is actually um, doing that. Uh, and then uh, there's a second uh, um, plugin assignment that's uh, that's an importer. To, so if we wanted to import a new file format, um, how would we build it? You know, to do it as a plugin in, in C++ code, and then you know once once it's a plugin, you can um, you can uh, you know plop it into other projects. Um, sell it on the marketplace, uh, <laughs> you know, whatever you want uh, once you've got that plugin code. Um, uh, and then the last bit. Which, so uh, let me um, ask you a question. So are, these are generic enough so that if, uh, you know, you're uh, a C++ instructor at another institution and this is not specifically your um, area of expertise, you can study, you know, though you're a C++ instructor, but, you know, you maybe don't know Unreal that deeply. Uh, you can look through these and you will gain enough information so that you can get those aha moments and and yeah, translate I mean, the, the content. The idea was that um, you shouldn't need to know, uh, you know, yes, I, I know a bunch about Unreal um, now uh, after spending a year there, but you shouldn't need to to have that level of knowledge to be able to, to use this to to teach the students and 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 that's both you know on a on a big level like I just want something to teach students how to navigate around a gigantic piece of code. Um, it doesn't even have to be a game engine, but the skills that you learn on how to navigate around a gigantic piece of code, it's it's something that's really useful for the students to know and. And you need to give them a gigantic piece of code to for them to be able to to do it to try it, um, and uh, and so that's um, that's the sort of the one level. If you do want to learn Unreal, you shouldn't have to be an expert in Unreal to use this. Um, at least the goal is to kind of bake, you know, pull the knowledge out of my head and stuff it into these slides, so that um, that uh, they. They don't need to know that ahead of time, um, right? Because either. I can imagine um, being, a, you know, in a film school or in, in an audio school, you know, and and those students asking professors in their CS programs to say, "Well, how do I build audio importers or how do I build camera importers?" You know, to bring in data from, you know, or 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 even work with the uh, SDKs from other. Uh, pieces of software. I mean, this knowledge sounds like it would be really valuable so that uh, people can help us understand, you know, how to bring that data through, because that's what we get yeah. asked all the time. Yeah, yeah. So the, the last piece, um, uh, last couple of lectures are about how to actually get into the engine itself, not just at the plugin level. Um, and uh, the assignments that um, that go with that are um, making a new material node because uh, um, you can't build a new material node in uh, for the material system in a plugin um, at least you know not not until somebody changes the engine um, <laughs> maybe somebody who's taken this class I don't know uh, so so adding a new material node becomes then something that you have to actually get into the depths of the engine to do. Um, and then I also have them just add a new rendering pass. Uh, so the, um, the, the, the example that I, I have them do is, um, uh, is basically uh, you know, making a kind of cartoony outline um, look on, uh, on whatever it is that you're rendering. And, and you know, the goal for both of those is just you know, these are things where where you're actually going and making some changes to what the engine's doing. And I think that is such a, like, I think that's a goal of so many people who want to start working in Unreal. Like, you know, even as technical artists who aren't even programmers, they're like, oh, I want a cell shader, but I want it to be like in the material dropdown. I just want a, a material domain or a lighting mode, that's the cell shader or whatever that is. Um, and that's that's their ultimate goal. But then they see this eight million lines of code, 
and go, I don't even <laughs> maybe know I don't need to that. start <laughs> with that. Yeah, maybe I'll <laughs> maybe just I make a post-process so <laughs> shader and we'll be good to go. Uh, but really what they want to do is is implement that. And we want them to, to do that too. But it is, it's such a, a daunting exercise to get in there. And this is such a, uh, a really thoughtful way of stepping through, like you said, kind of under, not learning unreal, so that's a big task, but understanding the structure of it and how you can, um, you know, implement things at, at kind of different stages of knowledge when you start out. It's very like in the editor, using the material editor. And by the time you're at the end in lecture 10 and 11, you're now modifying the actual engine code. Um, and, and working in those 8 million lines of code directly. And, and it, by the time you get there, that no longer seems scary because you, you understand and you have all these clues and, 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 and techniques that you've taught. Uh, well, I, I think one of, the biggest, one of the biggest things that you sort of have to learn along the way is um, no one person understands all 8 million lines of code. Mm -hmm. um, you, you cannot freeze up until until the time that you understand all of it before you start doing something you have to kind of make your little bubble where i understand this piece i understand what's coming into it i understand what's coming out of it and now i can make changes and as long as i as long as i you know stay within that bubble or expand it if i need to then uh then i don't need to understand all eight million lines um, and, and mm -hmm. with 8 million lines of code, there's, there's lots of examples of other places where it's doing things that are similar to what you want. And so a big part of it then becomes you know, find someplace else that's doing something similar and see how it works uh, and, and kind of you know, follow that example. Absolutely. I think in this guide, you probably spend as much time uh, describing where to go to see examples or, or to copy paste stuff, or you're like, go oh, get this, duplicate this. Um, and, and that's, those are valuable skills. And it's something that, like you said, like typically students learn to create something completely bespoke, something that's totally theirs and not a terribly realistic view of the real world. Um, and, and that goes for kind of, you know, any large production. Um, and, and now as things have gotten, it's just, you know, to 8 million lines of code uh, and productions, that's indicative of the whole production, whether you're talking about uh, just the code or the art and everything, there's now we're starting to see more of this acceptance of, of middleware, of, of, of game engines, of Quixel mega scans, of marketplace assets. That even in Hollywood, like, you know, if you watch The Mandalorian, they didn't go out and scan all the stuff. They went to Quixel and, and bought it. Um, and they used middleware to create, you know, yeah, a and, loved and, IP. And saw, so it's still, question. it's now okay. Whereas it used to be a little bit like not okay. And I think academia has taken a little bit to, to catch up with that idea that maybe you won't be creating the entire thing. Um, I, I don't think it's that academia is trying skill. to catch up to that. I think it's more that, um, you know, in the scope of what you can typically ask a student to do in, mm. in a 12 or 13 week class, mm. you just can't, you know, the, you can only go, you know, so, get so far. Right. Um, right. And so, you know, a big piece of what we're trying to do here is is help them to develop the skills to to understand that uh, that you really you know that to make changes in a gigantic thing like this, your actual change can be pretty small. Um, I I tell you know my students who are doing my class that's that's using this material, it's like um, I tell them start super early because you know at the end of the day you might be you might be writing four lines of code. Question is, which four lines? <laughs> 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 and 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 figuring out, um, or you know, maybe it's more than four. But it, it you know, right. typically the actual solutions for any of these these projects in this are not that that huge. It's it's finding the examples, and 
Yeah, a lot of students have, and and professionals even are are used to going online to find. You know, you go searching and you find an example that's similar to what you're trying to do, and you know, you're not going to find that for this. But those examples do exist. They're just in that code, and and so it's it's really about learning. You know. Learning that you no know, Google doesn't exist to search the code, but there are tools to help you do it. Um, it was uh, an interesting question popped through um, from T Sider AB about uh, when do you decide to make a plugin versus an actual engine modification? I, I saw that one go by. I was actually thinking that was a, that was a great question. Um, uh, for me, if it is possible to do it as a plugin, I would probably do it as a plugin. That makes it uh, uh, sort of both, both more transportable uh, because you don't have to give your engine mods to somebody else or to take you know port them over to another project. Um, uh, and also uh, kind of more uh, uh, resilient to new versions of the engine. Um, mm. But... You know, not everything can be done in a plugin, and and it's it's you know Unreal is is layered. Uh, so actor or or you know like the, the actor code, the the game code can call other game code or plugins or engine code. The plugins can call other plugin code or engine code, mm. and then the engine modules can can use other engine models but modules but an engine module can't use something that's in a plugin so you kind of you get this layering and so there's some stuff that can only happen by changes down at the bottom um and uh and so um yeah so i would say if what you're doing is an importer uh for a new file format i do that as a plugin that's it's that's a perfect you know it fits perfectly with the plugin system it doesn't need to be in the guts of the engine, um, mm -hmm. but if what you're doing is is uh, you know, adding a new material node or changing the behavior of something that's already in the core engine, you gotta How do the let me ask you a question? How do then uh, things like Niagara work that that you load as plugins? Is that a different type of thing then? Uh, so so things uh, so plugins that are provided by epic are are just plugins <laughs> they're they're really no different from the ones that you could build yourself except that they come with um uh, but can so, they call engine code you because uh, the example you just use about plugins calling plugins and engine calling engine would something then like niagara not be able to call the engine or uh, I oh, just no. so the plugins can can use stuff that's in the engine uh but that that niagara cannot um if you do something in your project code if you write a function and act or someplace niagara can't use that mm -hmm. you can use niagara but niagara can't use the stuff that's above it so niagara you know as a plugin um cannot assume anything about the projects that it's dropped into. Interesting. That's mm -hmm. very informative. Hmm. But of course, we may make some engine changes so that Niagara can access that engine data. Well, and, and as you know, well, because, so, so you know, like, we get to kind of control the whole kit and caboodle. Things like uh, material nodes. To make a new material node right now, that is an engine change. It would be a mm. pretty major change to the way the material system works to to make material all you know recreate all of that and have it be able to be in a plugin. But mm -hmm. you know, you could make those engine changes to the material uh, to the material system in the engine side, and then enable plugins people to have plugins. Um, you know, both Epic and outside that plugins that do new materials. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, you know, especially as Epic, but as anyone with, who has access to the engine, you, you certainly can make engine changes that make it easier to fit the rest of your stuff into a plugin. That's very cool. If you see some questions in here that you want to address, Mark, please feel free. There's some 
interesting question here about machine learning uh, models, but what, what specifically about machine learning models are you asking about? Yeah, I'm not sure what uh, what that one's wanting to know. Um, yes, what would you like to know? So, um, do you is when you've taught this course is this an undergraduate course or a graduate or mixed? Who is this? Who uh, is so this I, aimed to originally? Uh, mostly undergrads. Uh, I have some grad students. Uh, who take it, um, typically in a class of 30 to 40 students, I'll have a couple of grad students and the rest are Uh-oh. We have freeze. We have a frozen. If Mark's frozen, he will come there. He comes back. Uh, yeah. Ah, you're so, back. Uh, I, I think that uh, um, there, there must be a, a place in today's world for those, those people who cover themselves all in silver and act like a statue in a park. Now, <laughs> now they're in Zoom calls, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Is he frozen? He's really good. <laughs> he hasn't even blinked. As long as it's as long as it freezes me in it. <laughs> oh well, no, look, Mark's frozen. I can't tell. Oh, but wow. Mark's just doing now it. I oh man, I'm totally. <laughs> oh, he <out>. blinked. <laughs> <laughs> so the question, no, so uh, was, the question about now machine we know learning, what Mark Flanagan did before he came to Epic <laughs> was about <laughs> training machine learning. Um, but that's not really. Is that uh, an area of expertise for you in any way, Mark? So, so I, I am really, um, when it comes to applications, I'm really a graphics rendering guy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I mean, I, I tried to make, I mean, so graphics is definitely the example in, in this. Um, I mean, I tried to, in terms of uh, you know, how do you make changes, find and make changes in a large code base? How do you find and make changes in the engine? How do you do things in a plugin? So I tried to, to do it in a way that that would be just as useful for someone who's uh, who's interested in you know the the animation system or the UI system or uh, or you know any of the other parts uh, the physics system the you know sort of any of the other parts of the engine but uh, the examples are all kind of graphicy right. because. Yeah. That's what I know. <laughs> right, right. Mm -hmm. And that's the mm -hmm. context of the class where I cover this material sure. um, is one where we're doing a bunch sure. of stuff. Yeah, so thank you guys for your questions about machine learning. That's not really, um, I think, something that we can address too much in today's <laughs> stream because uh, that's not an area that we um, are have the expertise in today. Yeah. But we'll see what we but, can uh, do. But, you know, if y'all are really interested in that, that's something that we can uh, research and find some folks to bring on. I mean, it's certainly a, a hot topic uh, that's, that's happening these days, especially outside of games and inside of games as well. Uh, now there's, you know, hardware shipping that's got uh, AI accelerator cores, et cetera. So, um, it's a hot topic within Epic as well. So, yeah, if, if that's something that you're interested in, please uh, don't hesitate. If you ever have an idea for a stream or some feedback to our streams, um, you know, drop us a line at ueacademia at unrealengine.com. Uh, if we don't know, we don't know. Uh, yeah, T Sider had a follow up question about um, is there a high level way to see what modules are exposed uh, to the plugin layer? Uh, no, but, <laughs> um, so, uh, within the, um, uh, within the, the engine when you're, when you're running it, uh, and I should have launched a copy before we started here. So maybe I'll, I'll fire one up. And by the time I'm finished, finished answering, uh, it'll be um, it'll be up and running. 
uh, um, but uh, so within the engine, you can uh, you can get the list of of modules. So um, uh, so everything within Unreal, whether plugins or all the sort of code stuff within Unreal, whether plugins or uh, um, uh, or uh, engine code is broken into these modules, and the modules are basically independent uh, pieces that are compiled separately. Um, and and so when you're doing code, either plugin or engine level, uh, you're mostly going to be working on one of those modules or within one of those. And that that means that that when you hit the build button, it's really only going to have to rebuild that one module, which saves you from having to do the sort of full engine rebuild. Um, but uh, for a lot of the modules, as long as it's not sort of too deep into the engine, you can actually recompile and rebuild them straight from the editor. Um, which is even the engine modules, as, as long as it's not mm. like deep, deep, deep in engine functionality. <laughs> um, and so uh, it doesn't it doesn't give you a graph of what the dependency is between them, but you can at least get the list of modules in the editor there. Uh, the other thing you can do is every module uh, has a, a, um, a build file that describes its dependencies uh, in in the engine code directory. So it's it's like you know I am this I I provide this module. I need these modules to be loaded before mm -hmm. me, and uh, and so you can go look at those um, uh, at the at those files for that. It would be interesting for somebody to build a tool that actually scraped through those files and built a little graph like <laughs> representation. There isn't one right now. Uh, but that's where the data is. But this is the, what you just did. What you just described is exactly the thought process that you're trying to teach in this course is I don't know, but I know where I might start looking for clues. Uh, and that's kind of what you described, right? Like I'll look here, I'll look at these headers and these includes and I'll start to get some clues and there isn't a straight answer, but I can, I can piece it together. And like you said, well, you know, some of this, some of the engine code in Unreal was written a decade ago. Like, even even though that that person is still at Epic, if I if I went over to Nick Darnell and was like, "What about this code from twelve years ago?" He's gonna not be real happy. With me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know. That was twelve years ago. It's probably not great code <laughs> to my standards now, at least my experience in coding is anything. Um, but that that really is just such a it's a, a key a, a key skill to have working in these big code bases. Learning yeah, how find, to investigate. Find in all files is a huge uh, is is something that everybody <laughs> should know the shortcut for that. Absolutely, uh, and I teach you know, it even in, with blueprints. <laughs> like turn off context sensitive and just read the list and see what's available one day, because then at least you can get a clue. Of what well, and, you can and, do. and actually mentioning blueprints is, is a is a great point um, that you know, every blueprint node uh, is well, so some blueprint nodes are built out of other blueprint nodes, but all the sort of core ones are basically there's some simple C++ code underneath them. And and so a lot of times finding an example of how to I want to do something that's similar to something that blueprint node does, but it doesn't do it quite right for me. Mm -hmm. um, then uh, you know a good starting point is find the code for that blueprint node, and and the great thing about it is the name of the blueprint node with the words all jammed together is usually the name of the C plus plus function because those <laughs> those blueprint names are auto generated anyway. Right. Uh, from the C++ code. So, you know, once if you know there's a blueprint node or you find something online about one that's similar to the behavior you want but not quite right, um, it's, it, you know, that is that is like, it, what you need is those little anchors, those little things that you can can use as as a starting point to start sort of pulling apart what, what the, what's actually happening in the engine. Oh, totally. And it's totally like, you know, what we do, we don't, start a new shader class from scratch we go grab another one copy paste it and start renaming things and uh you know because that that work is a lot of times it's it's 
it's kind of fidgety, especially header files and getting all the boilerplate and everything all all tucked in. And often, yeah, it is. It's ninety percent of what you want, but I need I need it to also output the depth. Well, I can or or in. somebody mentioned looking for unique strings in the material editor. That's mm. yeah. If you want to make a new material node, even if it's completely different from any material node that already exists, your first step is find find a material node that has a super unique name. So when you search for that name, you get a bunch of hits in the material system and not everywhere else in the engine. So add, probably not your best choice, but like, uh, you know, vector noise, probably a pretty good one because it's pretty unique or, you know, any of the something that's pretty unique. And then you find sort of each of the places where that is, I need something that looks like this, but is mine. Uh, and so you can kind of just kind of clone the individual pieces and, you know, rename them. And then, okay, now you've got a material node with a different name that does the same thing as the old one did. And then you can start hacking the behavior and make it do something completely different. See, everybody, even Mark Alano, copy pastas. It's, <laughs> <laughs> do you, it's Mark, a professional skill. Do you get into uh, integrating third-party libraries at all in this particular guide? No. Uh, although, um, uh, yeah, I, it's, I don't, but I, oh, we lost your audio to, um, you know, we, from we this guide, get the skills that'll get you there. Um, we lost the, the audio at the beginning of your sentence. Could you repeat that please? Oh, uh. Yeah, so I, I don't specifically deal with integrating third-party libraries, but um, uh, I do briefly deal with the, the build system. Uh -huh. uh, and and basically, you just need to, to add uh, some stuff in the .cs build uh, script to tell it to load that library, um, uh, that you depend on that library, and uh, and then build a plugin that uses it. So... Uh, you know, taking any of the other examples that use a third-party library, so pick any plugin that, that's built on top of another third-party library, look and see what it does, and um, and go from there. Gotcha. So um, I want to take it back a bit to the the uh, the eight million lines of code and uh, compiling the engine and working in modules, etc. Um, one, that's 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 really important for people to to know because I know when I started out thinking about dealing with engine coding, um, and I did my first engine compile, I was like, oh no, <laughs> is this what I'm gonna have to do every time I put a print string in here? Like, I, this is gonna be awful. But it became very apparent right away. Oh, I'm working in these modules, and they they each compile. And I'm not recompiling the whole engine, and that, and and I just kind of wanted to bring that back up that that's that's key, and I think a lot of people are a little hesitant to start digging into that because that first experience of you know downloading a massive thing off of GitHub and waiting, you know, especially if you're working on a laptop with you know two or four cores, that wait's gonna be a little bit, um, and then you know that that's going to discourage you from really digging in often. But really, the, the truth of the matter is, once you go through that initial pain, unless you are digging into those very, you know, core uh, elements of the engine, which you probably wouldn't be doing right away, uh, you really are working in these these modules, which um, compile much quicker and are much much more um, much more concise than the the entire engine. So you're not. You know, you're not really dealing with eight and a half million code. You are dealing with, uh, you know, tens of thousands of lines of code. It's not, you know, small fry anyway. But, um, you know, it's it's and seeing that structure and understanding that is really essential for people to to feel capable of uh, tackling this, uh, because yeah, the the idea of modifying the entire engine is really intimidating. And so the way that this guide is, is broken up really helps guide you towards that. So by the time that you are actually getting the engine and doing your first modifications, you're not, one, making the mistakes of having to do that. And someone's already told you, hey, don't worry, 
this is going to take a while. <laughs> and then we're going to, it'll just, you, we'll do it this way. And then that won't be such a, a, a horrible thing. And, and having that out there is, it's, it's you know, um, I know it, it stopped me a few times uh, in my tracks early on before I, I really understood because it, it was really intimidating to, to get started with that. Yeah, so getting getting ready for the new semester, I've been um, where I'm teaching this class again at UMBC. Uh, I've been doing a lot of engine builds on a lot of different systems, and uh, so my laptop, which is uh, four core, two and a half gigahertz uh, uh, or so, took about an hour and a half. Um, uh, uh, four. Four core system that we had at school uh, with a, so with SSD on mine, one with a spinny disk at school was about two hours. Um, I've also been doing a bunch of stuff with Amazon, uh, so doing building on Amazon instances, and um, uh, I tried it on a 32 core one there, and that took about 20, 25 minutes. Um, I did not bother with one of the 96 core ones that they have. Um, I might try that later and see how fast <laughs> that goes. But uh, um, uh, Well, and that's yeah, certainly so, an option. If you find yourself needing to recompile the whole engine all the time, you might want to consider, even in a temporary sense, uh, in you know this virtual world, a lot of us are just stuck on a laptop now. We used to be able to go to a school that had a lab full of high powered machines and maybe even a render farm tucked away somewhere. And now I think most of us are on some uh, much less powerful uh, home system. Um, and and uh, it's becoming, it's really becoming much more popular to use uh, these virtual workstations. We're experimenting with it internally. Um, and it's an interesting approach certainly to leverage that um, to virtualize your work. If you've got a not great system that's really struggling, especially because, you know, if you're doing coding, you're going to be leaning on your CPU really hard. So if yeah, you've you, gone you and want, got a really you great You want GPU, as many cores as you can, as you can afford. Uh, you want at least two to four gig of memory per core. So, mm -hmm. so big, big, uh, mistake is to, to, increase the number of cores without increasing the amount of memory because that gives you less less per core which really hurts mm. um, well, that's an interesting and, insight and you want uh uh for if you're doing a lot of engine compiles you really would prefer to have an ssd although i do i do a lot of my work um on an external um uh ssd uh usb3 whatever um it's fast enough and uh uh, definitely faster than, than a spinning disk for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, so. In addition to that, when you're teaching, you're not just you might not just be doing one engine compile. You might end up, you know, with thirty, sixty, ninety, one hundred and twenty students in a semester. Uh, so could you talk to us maybe a little bit yeah, about your strategies yeah, so for, for dealing with one. this? Because <laughs> yeah, so. uh, it's even dealing with just project files. They're multi-gigabyte files, mm -hmm. and this is a challenge in every aspect of teaching them. So, so what I do is I, I make a, a fork of the engine um, in, in a, a GitHub uh, group or team. Um, I guess it's group. I don't remember the GitHub terminology, but I make a fork of the, the engine and then I have the students fork from me. Um, and so, uh, so to grade it, I'll, in a single local repository, I'll pull each student's uh, submission from their individual GitHub um, into a branch. So you've got, I've got one GitHub repository uh, for all the students where, where every student's work is a separate branch in that repository. That's great. Um, so the, uh, and I've got some scripts that come. I, are you giving out the scripts with the, with the yep. guides? Yeah. So I've got some scripts that, that you can run in like the Git bash window or whatever to kind of help with it. But, uh, um, the key thing there is that, um, uh, because of the way the, 
it works. The files that did nobody changed, you only kind of have one history of. Um, so you don't end up needing to have a repository that's big enough for n copies of those that stuff. Um, mm -hmm. The other super important thing is that uh, when you check out another student, you've, you've compiled one student's project. When you check out another student's project, the source files that they have in common don't get updated in uh, in your in your you know local repo, so they haven't they don't get recompiled. You're basically just doing a local recompile of the files that are different between the students, not of the entire engine. Oh, that's so helpful. So again, you're you'd only be recompiling those individual modules and files, and that yes. and also you know with if you've ever worked with Git and you've worked or SVN and you don't have a good branch setup, you end up downloading the entire thing each time. If they were each individual strings, streams or, or uh, branches, you'd have to pull down the entire thing essentially, essentially for it to really work. So it's really key to leverage that, that side of GitHub because otherwise that would be really painful. Yeah, first, first time I taught the class, I hadn't figured that out. And, um, uh, the, you know, my TA, uh, a week into grading the first assignment basically was like, you know, screaming at me and, uh, um, ultimately, um, I, I also typically will have them submit, uh, images and, uh, video of their projects running and, and do a lot of the grading from those rather than actually, uh, needing to rebuild and run every um, every student individually because mm -hmm. uh, you can you, know, you can get a lot from looking at the code and and seeing their their capture of what uh, what it did and Absolutely. and only kind yeah. of need to spot check a few of them you know if uh, if the code that they have doesn't seem to match the image that they I try and run and see <laughs> what does it really do. Let's just say there not, might be reasons not, not <laughs> that the, you not might want to take a look at the code. Submit, uh, reasons you know, images that were not <laughs> accurate to the to the code that they submitted. I've never heard of such a thing. <laughs> uh, and that's and it, that's actually um, a twofold. One, that's in the guide, in the the assignments. Uh, you have the rubric, and the rubric is: I want you know a screenshot. I want you to render a sequence or sequence, etc. I mean, it's really not you know submit the code because you don't want to read a bunch of code. Oh no, I totally read don't want to read a bunch of code. Uh, um, they want to see I... the results, and in games, it's it's a little bit the same. Like when you're submitting your portfolio, when you're looking for a job, you're not going to be submitting pages of code for someone to read. You're going to be showing the results of your code. I mean, that's often, that's really, you know, what's key. And then of course, if you're dubious or you're like, that's amazing. How did you do that? I'm going to, I can, I can take a look. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's a, that's a key insight that if you're starting to teach this, you might not have to read all the code. And then second fold is that that's very much, how industry works. You know, if I'm an art director um, and someone submits a new asset to me, it's very likely that it's going to go through a process and go get rendered. And I'm just going to get a, a turnaround in yeah, when, email when it and comes MP4 to and, When it comes to applying for a job, um, you know, the, the key thing is to have something, I mean, an image or video like on a website, uh, you can get people to watch. Um, they are not going to download and run your awesome executable, no matter how awesome the game that you built was. Um, because, you know, last thing that, you know, random recruiter wants to do is download a bunch of unsigned EXE files from <laughs> random people <laughs> and run them on their computer. Um, <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Um, so having capturing that you know results of what you did as as image or video is a is a form that that you know they can see what you did in in the first five seconds uh, of watching it and if it's cool enough 
then they might go and check it out um, and and run it. But um, you know, you're probably going to get the interview based on what it looks like uh, more than getting them to run it. Absolutely. Just like for artists, you know, we don't want to watch you modeling and and painting. We want to see the mod the painted model. Uh, mm -hmm. We want to we want to taste the cake. Uh, it's it's what it's all about in the end. Well, so um, I think we're kind of to, to the, the 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 thing here. The, the thing? question has come up: Where do you get this thing? Where's the thing, Tom? Where is the thing? Where's well, the we thing? have the thing. Do we have and the it's thing? ready to release? <gasps> Can we? we so we've it? been working on this for a little bit, right, Mark? It's it's taken a little bit. Like Mark said, you know, it's taken you know some iteration to make sure that it uh, got to the level of quality that Mark and Epic wanted it to be at. Um, so this is really kind of a uh, kind of a big day for me <laughs> 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 to finally get this out there because um, I've been really excited about this. So we're going to post the link into the chat here. Uh, you can download it. It's just a download off of Box, it's a zip file full of goodness. And I have, uh, we I, will also be posting this on our educator page and educator resource page. And I have and something else. I will also else. post this on the forum as well. So and if you, you look for navigating large code bases, you should be able to find it. That's my hope. I'm going to put it all the place. And looky here. That's a QR code for the shortcut link. <laughs> you can take a photograph with your phone and get the, the shortcut. You should yeah, be but then, then the shortcut's on my phone, and I need it on my laptop. Yes, well, that's, <laughs> that's, that's uh, a thing. There's another way to do it. Technology. All right, did that make it out into the chat there? Did, did one of us post this? Or are we just make an empty prompt? Oh, I see the the QR code. Well, awesome, everybody! I, I hope everyone takes uh, gets gets a hold of it. Uh, you know, uh, start digging in. Uh, if you've got any comments, let us know. Um, Unreal Academia at UnrealEngine.com as usual. Um, yeah, I'm really excited for everyone to get their hands on this. It sounds like, you know, looking at the chat, it looks like a difference. Uh, you know, there's, there's learners who are like, ah, this is what I've been waiting for. Uh, I know that there's a lot of educators who are just, you know, super excited about this. Um, it's, uh, a couple of people said, this is, this is what I've been waiting for. <laughs> and I think, I think that's. I've been waiting for it. Everyone's been waiting for it. I think our this this specific side of of, of engineering uh, and and uh, you know graphics research and programming and, and engine programming and tools and all of this ties into this this huge side of the industry. And there's so many amazing jobs, and you get to do such cool stuff doing this sort of like fundamental work like this. Um, so I'm really happy that this guide is out there to help bring more people into that side of, you know, uh, computer science, because graphics are the, for me, that's the fun side of computer science um, is the, that mix between, I've always enjoyed, I'm writing some code and then hitting enter and then having someone come over and go, that to me is magic. Like I took computer words and turn them into joy for someone. Um, and that's, that's always hooked me as a, as a technical artist and an artist is that, that intersection between the technology and the art. So uh, uh, any other questions or anyone else? People are saying we're being mean. <laughs> <laughs> what are we being mean about? I think for having the QR code, but yeah. not posting the actual oh, do we link not on have, the chat. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I can't do that to y'all. Oh. It's a puzzle. A conundrum in a puzzle. 
All right, we'll give a <laughs> link right. as well. Making them work for it. Okay. It will be Some, soon. Do one of you have that link? For whatever reason, my I copy paste keeps putting a whole bunch of garble in. Here. Here's a short, Please help here's me. A short link. There There's you go. There's a short link. I'll just make sure that one works. I'll click on it from my side. Oh, that's not it. <laughs> that's not the it's right like link. Lighting workshop. Oop. What is going on with the box? Hmm. Has our box drive done something strange? But what is this live? <laughs> it should have been the right one. Is that the here we go. Instructor guides release. That should have oh, been the right one. Okay. There we go. We'll get there. I hope nobody gets rickrolled. There you go. <gasps> I'm gonna check this one. Clicking on it too. That looks very much like it. Here's Simon a slightly selections. easier one to, to remember there. Sorry about that, y'all. Apparently, uh, Box wanted to uh, change short links for us. That's neat. First link was an old one. All right, so this one, I'm going to check that one last. There we go. That one works. It does. I Navigating checked. large code bases. It's yep. even got the right name in it. There we go. And uh, I'll post that onto the forum right after this, and we'll we'll tweet it out and all of that. And of course, uh, subscribe to the education newsletter. You know, smash like and subscribe, and I don't know all of Follow those and QB whatever channel we're on right now. Hashtag and stuff. Hashtag and lit. Hello, kids. And Mark, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. It's I think people really uh, are going to enjoy this guide, and mm -hmm. thank you so much for working with us on it and and uh, dog fooding it with us. And uh, yeah, really. Uh, yeah, and 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 uh, for anyone, I saw some people in the chat who were asking what what is it about the dog food. I think that's actually <laughs> something from Microsoft uh, back in the, the early days. Although all, it seems like all software developers talk about that, but. Yeah, it's become kind of a common term. It's certainly a kind of. Uh, it, it isn't derogatory in any way. It means mm -mm. we have to try our own product. That's right. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, we've, as engineers, have decided we're all producing dog food. <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> I'll let you all discuss that in the chat. What that means. <laughs> don't know. <laughs> but thank you again uh mark and thank you tom and thank you mark and uh thank you all for joining us and uh <laughs> thank you lewis and lewis and lewis and lewis and uh hope you guys have a good <laughs> safe weekend and hope that you spend a good weekend digesting this amazing uh instructor guide and and if you're instructors out there hopefully you'll uh, go through it and teach it to your mm. students because um you know this is rare to, I think, get this kind of caliber um, C++ content, and I think you will enjoy it. So till the Absolutely. next time, we actually are not going to have a stream next Friday because it is the beginning of a nice long weekend, and we're going to start it ourselves. So, But we will catch you the weekend after on Friday. And um, so have a safe weekend, and thank you once again. Thank you, Mark, and we will catch you all the next time. See you all. See you all in two weeks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Lewis. Thanks, Thanks Tom.